Hi everybody, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. Today we're going to be revisiting the CSS Electronics ZX Nucleon 512K. We built one of these in the past on this channel for a customer, and this time this one is from me. It's the new version for it on a beautiful purple PCB. So let's get on with it. We're going to take our time with this build and see what we can learn along the way. Here's a list of features from the eBay listing. It runs on a Z80 CPU, as you'd expect, at 3.5 MHz. We have a whopping 512 kilobytes of RAM, and it comes with a pre-programmed ROM chip. It says RAM paging is compatible with Pentagon 512K or your normal Spectrum 128K. There's a switch on the back of the board which forces it into 128K mode. It uses LS chips which can be easily replaced quite cheaply. There are jumpers on the board which switches between an SVHS PAL output and an analog RGB output. There's an AY chip and beep as usual, tape in and out so we can load from our tapes. There's also an amplifier on the tape in, so maybe I'll have some more luck loading from my phone as an audio device. It fits in a 48k rubber case with a rubber keyboard which is wonderful. There are bus drivers on all of the CPU IO signals and it runs from our bog standard ZX Spectrum 9 volt power supply. The eBay listing also links to a kit assembly video on YouTube, let's have a look at that. Hey look, it's us. This video is not sponsored by the way. Wink wink nudge nudge. So let's get on with it. As you'd expect, I got a bag full of bits and bobs and goodies, which I have been dipping into for other repair work and I've had to replace those chips as I've nicked them out of this kit. So what have we got? There's a bag of sockets and we've got lots and lots of bags of ICs. So let's pile all them up over here, see how many we've got. One bag, there's another bag, there's another bag. Turn that over. What's in this one? Oh, there's our programmed ROM chip that I mentioned earlier. Cool. What else have we got? Here's some big chips. That looks like a CPU and an AY chip. Lovely. There's some more chips and some more chips. Lots of chips here. That's because the entire ULA is being exploded out onto uh, LS chips, which we can replace easily. Here's some surface mount chips. Now that's a little bit scary, but we've persevered with this in the past and done all right. As you'll see, I'm not an expert at soldering these things on, but we'll get there in the end and we'll do a good enough job. Moving on, we've got a bag of various capacitors, electrolytics in there. Oh, there's some chips that I missed. This bag has jumpers in there for switching our video modes and some jacks and stuff like that. Here's a little bag that has our audio ports on and I think also a couple of switches for switching the memory modes. There's a bag full of crystals and push button one, PB1, is a reset switch. With the PCB out the way, there's a bunch more capacitors, resistors, more capacitors, more capacitors, more resistors, more resistors, more resistors, more resistors, a few more resistors, another bag of resistors, and some resistor banks, lots of resistors. God, this is gonna be a lot of soldering. What's in here? Diodes, cool. And in this one, keyboard connectors, cool. More capacitors, here we've got some more capacitors. And in this bag, more capacitors. Finally, some inductors, which we'll be soldering today because it's SMD day. So let's get started with our first SMD component, going for the voltage regulator, because from experience, this is the hardest thing to solder on the board. So I wanna get it out of the way. IC15 LM2596S 5.0, which means it will output a regulated 5 volt supply. This is kind of an evolved version of the 7805, which we're used to seeing on ZX Spectrums. Here's our datasheet. What can we see? There are various versions available, different voltage outputs, including an adjustable output, which will manage 1.2 to 37 volts output voltage. That's quite cool, but not relevant to us we can output up to three amps of current, which is plenty for us and all our peripherals. And we can put in up to 40 volts while we'll be putting nine volts in. So that's plenty of overhead. Here's an example circuit given in the data sheet. Let's have a little look. Pin one is our unregulated input from our power supply. Pin two is the output, which goes off through this inductor and off to the rest of our board. Pin three is just ground, boring. Pin four is less boring, it's a feedback. There's a feedback loop, so we're gonna get hopefully a really good regulated output. Pin five is on off, but we're just gonna be tying that to ground so that it's always on. 
and we'll be soldering the massive ground plane there on the left too. Here's the IC and I'm going to have to try and solder the big tab there on the top uh, in place and hopefully get the feet to line up on the pins on the left. Um, as I've said I'm absolutely useless at this although I have learned a bit I am using the big fat wedge tip on the iron and uh, putting loads of solder on the end here. I'll be honest this is my second crack at doing this I've already had it on and I had to remove it with a heat gun and clean up and try again so let's try again. I've put a load of solder on the right hand end there and I'm going to try and sort of shuffle it into place. I think I would have done a better job here if I had more heat so I could try and you know melt all the solder on the joint at one time. I don't know like I said I'm not very good but it's on there and I've had a good look around and I'm happy with it. Now we need to solder the five pins here and I know you can drag solder this SMD but like I said I'm not an expert I'm going to do them individually and I will learn later in this video to use an even smaller tip and finer solder to do a better job of this but let's struggle on and we'll get there. Just to be sure I haven't messed anything up I'm just going to do a quick continuity check around these five or six connections and see what's going on make sure everything's connected up correctly according to the schematic so pins one and two look good pin three is just ground that's fine pin four isn't connected I haven't actually made the connection so oh dear still learning uh, what about pin five give up on pin four pin five is fine that's also connected to ground so I did tidy up here we are that looks a lot better doesn't it third time's the charm moving on what's next on our SMD list going to go with L4 that's the biggest inductor in the kit the bag says 33 microhenries but it's been scribbled out and we've been given 47 instead there is a marking on here so it's not totally symmetrical inside but there's no indication on the schematic as to which way to put it so I'm going to copy the picture off eBay and just put it on so the text is aligned like this I don't suppose it would have a huge effect on this particular application anyway this should be relatively easy going compared to the last chip I'm going to flood this pad with solder and then wiggle the inductor into place so that the other joint lines up and it's sitting squarely within its footprint. If your eyes are being drawn to the apparent butchery of the LM chip, don't worry it cleaned up nicely, here's an after picture. I'm interested in learning some stuff along the way so let's have another look at the LM datasheet. L4 here corresponds to L1, there's a design guide in the datasheet and if we look at a 9 volt input voltage up to about 1 amp of load current which is where we're going to be operating, it's recommending inductor L22 which is 47 microhenries and if we head down to the table also in the datasheet we can look up L22 and see that it's recommending 47 microhenries current 1.17 amps and it even gives a few part numbers. The designer has gone for the DE1209 which can actually output 4.2 amps which is way more than we need to worry about so we're well covered. So I've connected the first joint and here's the second. Luckily there's enough exposed I can heat it and heat the component and just bosh a load of solder in there. And that's our first inductor fitted. Cool. So there we go. What's next? We've got L1, 2 and 3 in this bag too. Let's go with L1 and 2 next. Same story with these except they're a tiny bit smaller which actually will make them easier to fit. They do have markings on again, again I'm just going to copy the picture and align the text just like it was fitted on the eBay listing photo. Here's our L1 and here's our L2. Same deal as last time I'm going to flood one pad and I'm going to move it in from left to right to fit it and then just put some solder on the other pad. Again let's have a look in the schematic, here's L1 and you can see that it is connected to our AY chip VCC, the voltage supplied to our sound chip. Maybe because this is producing audio it's a good idea to try and remove noise. This 5 volts here is directly from the output of our LM chip and here's the pin 40 VCC of our AY chip. Lovely jubbly. Now L2, let's have a look at this one, it's over here by IC47. IC47 is our uh, PAL encoder, well it's a PAL or NTSC encoder, we're going to be using it as a PAL encoder. You can see it's between the same 5 volt supply and pin 19 which is VCC2 on this chip as we'll learn and pin 12 which is VCC1. Okay let's get this one in, should be easy, 
Um, oh, don't look at that. Tell you what, let's look at this. Here's our data sheet for the video encoder. There's a little table here which gives some capacitor and inductor values for what goes into pin 17. That's what we'll be looking at for the next inductor, L3, which will be our last surface mount inductor. So there's one joint made without any trouble whatsoever. Let's do the other joint and then move on to L3. L3 is even smaller, but shouldn't present too much of a problem. As I alluded to earlier, the value is given by the encoder's datasheet. We're looking for 68 microhenries paired with a capacitor. Because we're going to be using PAL, we want 22 picofarads, and we're going to tell the encoder that we want PAL by tying pin 7 to ground. We can see this in the nucleon schematic. Pin 7 is tied directly to ground. I think we're small enough now to use a microscope, so here's a little close-up shot of fitting this inductor. Oops, let's try again. I think I need to use a different set of tweezers for this, or if you have any tips, let me know in the comments. As a reminder, there's our value from the datasheet, 68 microhenries, the marking 680K corresponds to 68 with zero zeros after it, 68 microhenries. The K just means a 10% tolerance. All right, we're making some progress now. What's next in our bags of SMD goodies? We're gonna go for some ICs with loads of little fiddly legs on them. See how we get on. I'm gonna start by fitting IC1, 74 als 244 dw which is a bus driver. We'll learn about that shortly. Let's get it out of the bag. Here it is, the fiddly little thing. That marker on the bottom left there is marking pin one. We've got footprints here for IC one, two, three, and four, all along the top right there. And they're all bus drivers of one form or another. IC one sits at the top. We're gonna to be fitting it up there. So let's zoom in and get on the microscope. My strategy here is going to be to tack down the bottom right leg and then start from another corner and start soldering the pins one at a time. As before, we'll flood the pad with solder and then move the chip into place. I'm not using tweezers now because I haven't been having much luck and I'm guessing I'm not going to burn myself through this chip. So there's our first pin soldered and it's aligned quite nicely. Lovely, look at that. Now you can watch me learn that I need to use a finer soldering tip or you can have a look at this schematic with me. Here's the schematic for our Z80 edge connector and the bus drivers. Here's what we're fitting, IC1. It's split here into IC1A and IC1B. That's because the eight inputs which it can drive are split into two groups of four with their own separate enable pins on pins one and 19. All the Z80 outputs are grouped into this line I've highlighted blue and you'll see they all go off to our line drivers. IC1 receives a whole bunch of read and write and memory related signals, all prefixed with an X. So XWR, for example, for the Z80's write output. All these X prefix signals are the undriven signals from the Z80. So we have the eight bits of the data bus, XD0 to XD7. We have our 16 address lines, XA0 to XA15 some I.O. and memory related signals here in the bottom right. A few more statusy things in the bottom left here. And these are all driven by our bus drivers, ICs 1, 3 and 4, and a transceiver at IC 2. The result is a bundle of lovely 5 volt square wave clean signals which will go off all over the board on this green line. Once we've finished building it, we'll have a look at the inputs and outputs of those drivers just to see what difference it makes. So how's the soldering going? You'll see I've cleaned up my mess and I've switched to a finer tip and a finer reel of solder. This should allow us to solder without bridging pins like I did earlier. While we're doing that, let's have a little look at the data sheet for our line drivers. Here's a logic diagram. We can see it is an octal three-state bus driver. Octal means we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight inputs which can be driven. And three state means that our outputs can either be high or low, as you might expect, or set to high impedance. High impedance means it's not going to interfere with the rest of the circuit if we don't want it to. You might also see this referred to as tri-state. We can set the outputs to high impedance via pins 1 and 19. Pin 1 controls the first four outputs, pin 19 the remaining four. Setting these to low will set the outputs to high impedance. The Z80 is capable of giving up the control buses and the address bus and the data bus to peripherals and external devices. 
and it does this by setting its outputs to high impedance. And we put a line driver in between the Z80 outputs and the rest of the board, we need to make sure that we can set those driven outputs to high impedance too, so that we can continue to use peripherals and external devices as we're used to with our ZX Spectrums. Luckily for the designer, the Z80 has a bus acknowledge output, and what this does is it goes low if the Z80 is given up control to the external device. I thought it was interesting that the driven bus acknowledge signal was used for this purpose, to be a little bit more delay on that, but maybe it makes sense to synchronize it with the rest of the driven signals. The designer has carefully routed pin 19 to ground on IC1 because this is controlling the driven output of bus acknowledge. And if this particular output was set to high impedance, we'd never be able to switch our drivers back on again. As before, I'm going to continuity test all of these joints that I've just soldered because I don't trust myself. Actually, this one went well. Everything was connected up with no shorts. Let's go on to IC2, which is a transceiver. It's a 245 instead of a 244. It's a little bit different, but it's the next one down. So let's put it in place. Same story again. I'm going to tack down the bottom right pin, first by flooding the joint and then wiggling the IC into place, tuck down another corner and then get to work soldering the pins. And while that's going on, let's have another cheeky little look at the data sheet. This time we have an octal bus transceiver. We know what octal means, transceiver means it works in both directions. And once again, we have tri-state outputs. The direction is controlled by pin one, DIR. I thought the logic diagram was quite interesting to show how these things work. So if DIR is high and output enable is set low, which means output is enabled, A1 is allowed to flow through to the output B1. And on the other hand, if DIR is low, the AND gate on the left won't output anything, but this AND gate on the right will. And as you might expect, it allows B1 to become an input and flow through to A1 which is our output in this case. Not just A1 and B1, all eight channels can be driven like this. Take a look at IC2 in the top there. It's actually transceiving the data bus and nothing else. And I was interested to know how is the direction signal generated? The designer has used a NAND gate here in the bottom left using the read signal and the M1 signal, which are both outputs of the Z80. We can simplify it. We look at the truth table when the output is low, it gets inverted and direction becomes high. So the Z80 is outputting the data bus. All the other cases where Q is one, the Z80 will be reading in the data bus. This means the Z80 wants to receive the data bus when read is low, which means read is active. That makes sense. And it also wants to receive the data bus when M1 is low. M1 is low when the Z80 is in its fetch cycle. This means it doesn't know what it needs to do, so it goes and fetches the next instruction from memory. That makes sense, it would want to receive the data bus in that case. All of the cases, the Z80 wants to send data on the data bus. Cool. Okay, with that fitted, we need to move on to our next SMDs, and these, as you guessed, are going to be IC3 and 4. You don't need to watch me soldering them in. We've done one, we've looked into how they work, I'm just gonna skip over that. There we are, all fitted, and I've checked continuity, everything is hooked up, lovely. The last IC we need to fit is IC47. We've already come across this when we were fitting the inductors, but let's have a look anyway. It's a BH7236AF, and it goes over here. I wanna learn about it, so I'm gonna have a little look at the datasheet. It is an analog video encoder capable of encoding NTSC and PAL. We're going to be using it as a PAL video encoder. It says here it takes RGB component signals and outputs composite video, luminance, chrominance and RGB. Features, let's have a look. Yeah, loads of technical features that I'm not going to pretend to know what they mean. I like feature 11, don't know what that means. Applications, video games, perfect. Here's the schematic of our Nucleon and here's the datasheet showing the pinning and the internal structure of this chip. Pins 1 and 24 are ground. On pins 2, 3 and 4, we have our RGB inputs from our video circuit. Pin 5, no connection, good. Pin 6 is our subcarrier signal, which is a wave generated by this circuit here. Pin 7 is tied to ground because we want a PAL output. We'd set it high if we wanted NTSC. 
Pin 8 is an output, it's a burst timing signal output terminal but we're not using it. There are a few pins which we may or may not need to use, it depends on the chip that's been provided in the kit. Pin 9 is one which we aren't going to use so technically I don't need to fit that capacitor there. Pin 10 is the input for our sync pulses. I'm glad I can see all of these signals because I want to fit an internal HDMI port to this machine eventually. So hopefully we can hook that up with all these signals we have available. This chip generates a composite video signal and pin 11 gives us the composite sync output which we may or may not want to use. In this case we're not using it. Pin 19 and 12 there are voltage inputs. We've looked at them before with L2 in between the 5 volt supply and those pins. Again, pin 13 and 14, if we look at the data sheet, they're not used. This circuitry here is for the other kinds of chips which we may have been provided as our video encoder chips. We don't need to fit those components. 15 and 16, chroma and luminance. They go off to our video connector port via a couple of jumpers. 17 gives a luminance trap output, don't know what that means. 18, we don't use that one actually on this chip, so we don't need to fit that resistor there. Pin 20, again we're not using it, although that would be our composite video out. Last but not least we've got our RGB output signals going off to the video connector, again via the jumpers. Here are the jumpers, JP1 and 2, you use them to switch between RGB and SVHS. Ultimately this all goes together to produce the various video signals required to go to our DIN terminal and give us a lovely crispy picture on our screen. All in all a pretty impressive little chip and it's fitted to our board now which leaves just two components to go, two simple diodes. They're both the same, let's get them in place. Here's D13, it is part of our power circuit obviously because it's down here next to our voltage regulator. Reading the data sheet, apparently this is related to reducing noise, which can't be a bad thing. D12 is our final SMD component, it lives right up here by the power input socket and I believe it is a reverse polarity protection diode. And with that we've completed all of our SMD soldering tasks which is wonderful. Next video we'll be back on good old familiar territory through hole soldering. So stay tuned, I can't wait to get this thing finished so we can mess around with it and play some 512k demos. I hope you enjoyed the video and please like and subscribe.